Today, if you have your Bible, go ahead and take those out, turn those on to Mark chapter 10. Mark is one of the four Gospels, and we say this often, um, there's only one Gospel, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, but there are four accounts of the life and the works of Jesus, and it's found in the very beginning of the New Testament. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So today, we are going to be in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, and as you are turning there, uh, you know, you know, throughout history, people have celebrated greatness. I remember uh, there was a hockey player, and he was known as the great one. His name was Wayne Gretzky, and others like Michael Jordan, Serene Williams, Tom Brady, uh, of course, Coach Nick Saban, uh, and as of Friday night, maybe Freddie Freeman uh, could be too close to some of our Yankee fans, though, uh, have been considered the GOAT. Uh, the GOAT stands for greatest of all time, and a lot of times they'll use that word to describe how amazing they performed on an athletic field. And Jesus is not typically called the great one or the goat, but I want you to think about this. His life, his death, and resurrection have reshaped the course of human history like no other. And so today, we're going to take a look. Uh, what does it mean to be great? And, and, and even more so, what does it mean to be great in the eyes of God? You know, greatness is often defined by power, position, possessions, or prestige, but Scripture presents a different picture. And we're going to read that this morning in Mark 10. So if you would do me a favor, please stand for the reading of God's Word, the Holy Scriptures. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35 through verse 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to him, that is Jesus. Teacher, they said. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Isn't that our attitude a lot? What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And Jesus responds, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. And then he has this statement, can you drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they respond, we can. They answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at the right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those from whom they have been prepared. Verse 41. When the ten heard about this, the other ten disciples, right? When they heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They are so mad that they asked the question first. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. And I, I would say that you there, of course he's talking to the 12. I think he's also talking to us. Not so with us, right? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, uh, today, I believe that uh, we are uh, in a society that kind of pushes for greatness. Lord, that we can be the greatest in academics, that we can be the greatest in athletics, that we can be the greatest in achievements and accomplishments. And yet, God, I believe that you're going to redefine that for us. And Lord, you do so in a way that you challenge the world's view of greatness, in a way that you want us to look through the lens of, of a servant. And Lord, no better example than in your life. And so God, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would take your holy scriptures 
and show us something maybe new. God, maybe correct us in, in a thought that we have. Or God, encourage us in the path in which we're living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, you're going to be seated. As you're seated, I want you to see how the chosen shows us this. So turn your attention to the screens. Let, let's do it now. Let's ask. It will change everything. Mm -hmm. Ask what? Rabbi? Yes, Big James? Remember when you said that we could ask for anything and it would be given us? Knock and the door would be opened. I don't remember that. Um, that was the right sermon. Um, I thought my email told me it was the right I'm kidding. I remember. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we have something to ask and for you to do. I'm eager to hear it. Would you? Grant for us to sit at your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom. What does that mean? So, So today's passage begins with James and John. By the way, you need to know, two of Jesus' closest disciples, and they come with him with this uh, bold request, one that reveals, I would say, a lot about them, but I think it also reveals a lot about us as well. So James and John are going to ask for a favor, and this is not just some favor. I mean, this is a big favor. You know, Jesus keeps talking about his kingdom, and his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, and that somehow they've missed that, and yet they go, this is awesome. Like, we're going to be able to reign with you. And so here's our favor. We would like to sit on your right and on your left when we do enter into to this kingdom. You know, over the last several weeks, many of you have said to me, Pastor JJ, I just had to start laughing so that I wouldn't start crying. I think that's how Jesus felt in that moment. Uh, I, I love what Tara Lee Cobble says when she says, I honestly think it was probably hard for Jesus to keep from laughing because this is such a ridiculous request. You know, Jesus is seated, so you got to follow this. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. So technically, the Father is at Jesus' left, right? So I just can't imagine Jesus going into his Father and be like, Hey, sorry, Dad, uh, that seat's saved for John. Do you care to slide down one? Like, how is that going to work, right? So when Jesus responds to them, he says, Guys, you're not even capable of doing what you're asking for, right? And then it's going to be a rhetorical question. And however, they're going to answer it. So he says, can you do what is required of me? And I love how the chosen shows them kind of looking back at each other. And they're like, yeah, 100%. We can do that. No problem, right? I mean, can you imagine? And then Jesus tells them in a concealed way. Um, you're kind of right. You, you, you are going to be persecuted. You're, you're even going to, to be martyred for me. But the answer, still no. Um, by the way, we're just going to take a TV commercial break for a second. Um, this also serves as a great reminder for us that two of the three closest disciples to Jesus, they're in his inner circle. 
They received a no to something they asked for, but that didn't mean that God didn't love them. That didn't mean that God had left them or abandoned them or forgotten about them, right? What you're going to see at the end is actually God had something far better and bigger for them. And so their request, I believe, reveals a misunderstanding of Jesus' kingdom. They expected, they really desired an earthly kingdom, one where they would hold authority alongside Jesus, where they would have positions of respect, but Jesus... Jesus teaches that his kingdom is not about exercising power, it's about giving power. That Jesus' kingdom is quite different. So I want you to see this. Their sights were set on a crown. Jesus' sights were set on a cross. Jesus is thinking about a cross, and they're thinking about seating arrangements, almost like at Thanksgiving. Like, am I moving up to the, to the big boy table this year, right? Like, do I get to sit with the adults? And that's their thought. This scene is a reminder of another statement that Jesus made to Pontius Pilate when he asked about Jesus' kingdom. And in John 18, 36, here's what Jesus declares. My kingdom is not of this world. It's it's different. It's a heavenly kingdom. So unlike the kingdoms of this world that are built on hierarchy and dominance, Jesus' kingdom is built on humility. It's built on love, and it's built on sacrifice. So I want us to transition and look how Jesus is going to redefine greatness by service. Mark chapter 10, back to our original text. We're going to pick it up in verse 42. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you. By the way, he's not saying you shouldn't strive for that. I mean, he actually says, whoever wants to become great, and some of you should strive for that. You should strive to want to become great, but here's how. You must become a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave or servant of all. And and here's the verse, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. There it is. Now, I don't know if you underline or highlight in your Bible, or maybe you do both and you, you know, put a box or a square or something around it. I would encourage you to do that with verse 45. Look at it again. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, This is a revolutionary verse in so many ways. I mean, this is Jesus telling us why he came. Like here in just a couple months, we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. But here, Jesus is telling us why there was a birth. We know that Jesus would come. He would give his life for us as a ransom, that he would pay the penalty of our sins on the cross. And this is the gospel. It is the gospel that we love. It's the gospel that we cherish. It's the gospel that we hang on to. And here's my prayer for us, that we never get over the gospel. Like we never get over that we were lost And for those of us who've put our hope, our faith, our trust in Christ, we are saved. We've been found. We become a child of God. Like, don't ever get tired of that message that Jesus died as a ransom for us to pay the price of salvation, to save us from sin, from shame, from death, and from hell. But here's the thought this morning. Jesus came not just to save us. Jesus said, I came to serve you. So Jesus came not just to save us, but to serve us. Now, the word that Mark uses here, this this word serve or servant, is a word that we would use today as uh, someone 
who would wait on tables. Much like what Stephen was as the first person ever martyred after the death of Christ. It, we would call Stephen like basically the bread boy. He was the one passing out bread to the widows. And that is the same word here. It's this word of someone waiting on a table or someone serving you. I mean, think about it for a minute. When you go to a restaurant and someone comes to your table and they say, uh, how may I serve you? How can I help you? And if you're at Chick-fil-A, it's like, it's my pleasure to do so, right? But in a way, that is the posture that Jesus has towards you. And, and I just want to encourage you especially with everything that we've gone through in the last several weeks, that you could just allow that to soak in this morning, that right now, amidst all that we've been walking through, that Jesus said, according to his words in the scripture, that I came to seek and to save the lost and to serve, that I didn't come to be served. You know, when we were looking at this passage today, the, the teaching team and I, we almost felt like, like a, is it blasphemous to say that? To, are we allowed to say, to talk about Jesus as our waiter? Like, what does that mean? And yet Jesus is the one who said, I came to serve. It's why I'm here. So when you think about it. There is nothing more this morning than all of us need than for Jesus to serve us, to Jesus to help us. Now, I, I hopefully I can put this in context for you. I'm not able to be the husband to Sharon unless Jesus serves me. I, I'm not able, I cannot be. The father to three boys, and as of last Saturday, uh, a daughter-in-law, so we finally have a girl in the house, right? I'm not able to be their parent unless Jesus is serving me. I can't be your pastor without Jesus serving me. I, I can't be a man of integrity and walk in holiness without Jesus serving me. So desperately, I all of us need Jesus' help. We need him to serve us in those ways. So again, Chris and I were at lunch, I think it was Wednesday, and we were beating this thought up where Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And what does that look like for us today? Well, one of the things we know is Jesus said that I've go I'm going to leave. And once I leave, someone greater is going to come, that I'm going to give you guys a gift. It's what we would refer to as the Holy Spirit. It's the, the third part of the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And Jesus is the one who says, I'm going to serve you by giving you the gift of the Holy Spirit, where when you become a believer, not only do you experience forgiveness and salvation, but you get a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit living inside of you in a way to serve you to become more and more like God so that your life can offer him honor and glory. But this whole thought of does it belittle the risen Christ to say he was and is and will ever be a servant to his people? Well, I would say if servant meant... One who only takes orders, then yes. If servant meant, uh, or if we thought like we were the master of Jesus, then yes. Like you even saw in the, the scene there where, where Jesus gets almost angry, frustrated uh, with the disciples when they ask of this request, right? So it's not a servant as in Santa Claus, right? It's not a servant as in someone who just gives you everything and anything you want. That's not the case. But it does not dishonor him to say that we are weak and only through you can we be strong. It does not dishonor him to say that he is the only one who can serve us in the areas that we need him the most. See, it does not dishonor him to say that it's not even possible for us to love without you serving us by loving us first. That does not dishonor him. 
I, I want you to see how the Apostle Paul beautifully captures this in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Hey, it's going to be on the screens, but this is one of those verses you want to turn to, all right? So on your phone, in your, your copy of God's Word, if you would turn to Philippians, all the I-A-N-S's in the Bible come together, so if that kind of helps you, right? So near the end of the Bible, uh, if you would find Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And here's how Paul captures this moment. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, God the Son, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or that he had to hold on to, but he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, we need Jesus to serve us because in serving us, he saves us. But imagine with me for a moment that there, there's a young college student and uh, a CEO of, of a Fortune 500 company comes in and presents to the classroom as a special guest lecturer. And, and afterwards, this young student is dreaming of the power they could possess if they were a CEO. They're thinking about all the possessions they could buy, purchase if they were just the CEO. And never do they consider the long hours, the responsibility, the sacrifice, the weight of leadership that goes with that. Well, James and John are like that student. They're seeing the glory, but they do not understand the cost in which it comes. You know, you too might find yourself chasing after status. Maybe you're chasing after recognition. But Jesus calls us to something deeper. If you're a follower of his, and I, I pray and hope that you are, but if you are, there's something more for us. And I, I believe Jesus is going to show us what true greatness is all about. And it lies in service. It lies, it lies in sacrifice, in laying down our lives for others. So again, Mark chapter 10, look at that, that thought, 38 and 39. Jesus is going to challenge James and John after their question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism for which I will be baptized? Now understand this. Two words there. This picture of a cup and this picture of baptism. By the way, two things that uh, the church as an institution, there's two ordinances that we follow with. Uh, one is observing the Lord's Supper, which we use the cup, right? And then the other is baptism, which uh, represents someone who's uh, placed their faith, their hope, their trust in Christ. But in, th in this meaning, it's different, okay? This thought of the cup in Scripture, it symbolizes suffering. So Jesus is saying to them, are, are you going to be able to suffer the way in which I'm about to suffer? And, and that's the thought. So Jesus is speaking of the judgment that God the Father is going to bring on sin. And Jesus knew that he was going to have to take on sin. Therefore, that judgment, that cup would be poured out on him. And then the, the second word that Jesus uses there is that of baptism. Now, Jesus began his earthly ministry by being baptized. He was baptized in the Jordan. And some of you have been there. Some of us have had the privilege of, of doing that uh, again. And not that that makes you special or uh, you know, more of a follower, but there's this symbolic moment that you were baptized close to where Jesus himself chose to be baptized. And yet Jesus was baptized in the waters of the Jordan, and yet Jesus knew that there were waters ahead of him, deeper and darker. It was the dark river of death. 
So there, Jesus would be identified with the sins of the world. It was there that he who knew no sin would become sin, would take on sin. And there, the Lord of life would taste of death for every single person who's ever lived. So two things to know about this. First of all, look on the screen. The cup spoke of the inward suffering that Jesus was going through. Some of you may remember that when Jesus was in the garden, that he began to pray and, and that there were, there were drops of blood that came from him. And we know scientifically that someone can be so anxious that there can be such a uh, uh, trial and tribulation going on in someone's life that that physically can happen. And so Jesus is, 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 is thinking about the suffering and the baptism spoke of the outward suffering where scripture would, would reveal to us and Josephus, that historian of that day would write to us that his body would be unrecognizable. So there was an inward suffering that Jesus was going to go through, and there was an outward suffering that Jesus was going to go through. And so Jesus is going to challenge James and John as a reminder, and I believe also as a reminder for all of us, that following him comes at a cost. And, and, and I, I would ask that you would forgive pastors like myself and others for so many years we just wanted Jesus to be so attractive that we failed to mention that following him comes at a cost. That Jesus says that you must count the cost before following him. Look at Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, and by the way, there is not a better life that you can live. There is no one better that you can go after. But Jesus says, let them deny themselves, sacrifice themselves as Jesus sacrificed himself. Take up your cross, that is God's plan and purpose for your life, daily and follow after him. So as we look at bringing a close to this, I, I, I want to talk about a few people who've lived out this servant leadership. You know, leadership is not a path of comfort. And any of you who sit in that position, you know that so well. But it's one of sacrifices. And a lot of times, no one ever sees the sacrifices of the person in leadership. It's a call to lay down our lives of, to serve God and others just as Jesus did. So, so let me tell you three people and kind of their thoughts understanding this text. One was Lauren Sandy. Uh, Lauren Sandy was one of the early members of what's known as the Navigators. Maybe some of you were at a college university and the Navigators played a big role in your spiritual discipleship. They love discipleship, the Navigators. And Lauren says this, how do you know when you have a servant's heart? And then his answer was, you know you have a servant's attitude when you react like a servant, when you're treated like a servant. Wow, how true. And, and then Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa understood this when she shared her simple path. Great book, by the way. Uh, the fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith, it's love. The fruit of love is service, and the fruit of service is peace. You know what our world is seeking right now more than anything? Peace. And, and a lot of people think it's going to come in an election, right? And by the way, I encourage you, if you are a believer in Jesus if not, uh, you should vote. Like, it is an amazing opportunity, and I would even say responsibility that you have. And I would encourage you to just do two things. One, uh, whoever you're going to vote for uh, or whoever you're going to vote against, 
make sure that you don't just watch an ad, uh, that you go to like their website and actually read, like here's what they're saying they're going to do, this is what they're saying they are, right? It's really important that you exercise that, that you, you have that opportunity in our country. And so we crave peace. And a lot of times we think it's going to come from a ballot, right? But Jesus shows that true peace comes when we devote ourselves in serving other people. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once preached from Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And uh, he was speaking to people who felt like greatness was out of their reach. And he reminded them that everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Here's what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. You know, I believe that all three of their lives, and many of you seated even in here today, you you embody Jesus' call of serving. And and it reflects what Galatians 5.13 tells us. That through love, serve one another. You know, and I personally just want to say, uh, thinking about the sacrifices that many of you have made over the the past several weeks with two different hurricanes, right? Neighbors helping neighbors and first responders, the linemen, our our military personnel, our church and, and, and the GO team and all of those who have served others at really an expense to themselves. And in the same way, Jesus invites us. He encourages us, if we're going to follow him, not into a life of comfort, but into a life that may include suffering. That in a life that that could cause you to serve others for the sake of Christ. So here's the heart of the message as we wrap up. True leadership, true discipleship is not about being served. It's about serving. And just imagine for a moment. Uh, uh, Imagine your family, your home. Uh, Imagine your circle of friendships. Imagine your workplace or our church, the South Tampa community. Um, Imagine what would change if we embrace Jesus' form of leadership where we served others. You know, as we think about greatness in God's kingdom, let's remember Matthew 20, 16. Where Jesus says, so the last will be first, and the first last. You know, true greatness is not measured in accolades or titles or trophies. But I believe it's measured in how well you love, give, and serve. You know, Jesus showed us this. That the way up is down. The path to glory leads through the valley of humility. So in a world that chases after self-promotion, let us choose the path of self-sacrifice. In a world that chases after comfort and prestige, let us choose the path of Jesus. So again, let us close by looking at the verse that we began with. Let us close by looking at a statement as opposed to a question. That, that question, that favor that the disciples asked from Jesus, even by saying no to their request, the request of James and John, think about this, Jesus is serving them. He's actually doing them a favor. They ask for a favor. He's going to give them a favor, right? He's going to do something better. They just couldn't understand it at the time. There is zero chance that James and John would enter the kingdom of heaven and there Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father that they're going to walk up and go, "Uh, I believe you're in my seat. Could you move over? There's no chance that happened, right? So here's what I want you to see in retrospect. The no was the best response Jesus could have given them to their request. And I know many of you have had a no answer. And you've struggled with God 
for the no. And, and here's what I would tell you. In retrospect, you may go like James and John. Oh, now I get the no. So just keep that in mind. So even in taking that possibility away from them, Jesus is serving them. He's giving them something better. God is always doing, this is difficult for us, God is always doing what's best for us, but what's eternally best for us. See, God's always doing what's best for us, but not of this kingdom what's best for us, but the heavenly kingdom what's best for us. He washed feet. He fed thousands. He performed miracles. He walked to visit and heal the sick, the lame, the diseased, and the dead. He stopped to talk and to touch people considered unclean. He spent time with those that no one else cared to spend time with. Jesus, God the Son. The Most High King, the Lord of Lords, never placed himself in a position above anyone. He led by serving, and he loved by serving. Let's pray together. Father, what an amazing thought to look at the life of Jesus, the high and exalted one, seated at the right hand of you, And yet, God, he chose a life of humility. He chose a life of service. So, God, I want to pray for us as followers of Christ. Because, God, many times we have the attitude of James and John. God, we want what we consider best right here, right now. And yet, God, you you, you have an eternal plan for us. You have a kingdom plan for us. And God, the only thing we know right now, the only thing we can comprehend right now is it involves serving. So God, I pray that we would follow in your example. That we would serve to the best of our ability. And God, when it's hard to do so, when it's difficult to do so, God, help us just to think of Jesus going to the cross. God, help us to think of Jesus hanging on the cross. And God, it's not like, if he did it, we can do it. But that's the example. And Lord, we thank you for that. And so God, I pray today that you would show us that the path up is down. And the path to greatness is service. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.